I'm going to welcome everyone here to season two of Unsung. I wanted to pick this back up and I want to do it with the further impetus that I had when I started. And that was to bring in people that not only have I heard about, but people that I respect in this community, uh, people that are doing things, people that are even in spite of where we're at, people that are very engaged and they're people that we don't know much about. This individual is busy right now dealing with some of the things, like I said, we're talking about dealing with governmental bills and statutes and, and absolute positive, concrete ideas that are being formulated through the government, civically and federally, and starting to get legs for us, for our demographic, for that demographic of demographic of artists and uh, musicians, singers, songwriters, dancers, you name it. And I am so pleased to meet this guy, finally. Uh, and he was everything I would have expected. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rob Masiak. Rob, how the hell are you doing? Thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. I'm doing well. How are you? I am good, man. Uh, I'm even better now that I, I uh, we've met. <laughs> oh, it's fun to be here, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, like I said, I've heard so much about you and so much good about you. However, it wasn't until I uh, stepped into the town hall that the union had, mm -hmm. that our local union had, <clears throat> recently, in the last couple of weeks, and I heard you talk about the very things that people were only making necessarily suggestions about. And you started talking about these actual things that you are doing, these legislative, perhaps, uh, initiatives that you are involved in, uh, that you're, you know, having a hand in bringing forth, that you're having dialogue about, and are actually structured to some degree, either in terms of paper or, you know, uh, email, emails or actual bills, uh, and rights. Uh, I just thought that's a guy I need to talk to because I think that's a, you are the kind of guy that has information that all of us are suspecting doesn't even exist. That nobody is really doing boots on the ground, nobody's doing work, uh, and we're all just frustrated and bitchy. And then I realize uh, that, the, that, that you are doing something. So I absolutely want to get to that. But I think first, if you don't mind, I'd like you to just kind of take me through, you know, you and what makes Rob Masiak, uh, Rob Masiak, you know, where you studied, uh, you know, the, the people that you studied under, where you were born, you know, all these kind of things, just to give the people watching or listening an idea of, of you, the guy. Well, let's see. When I was 10 years old, I decided I was going to become a professional musician um, and, uh, and that that was the only thing that I wanted to do with my life. Uh, at the time, I was still playing clarinet and saxophone. Uh, I studied with Mark DeYoung, Pat Beliveau, and Eric Friedenberg. And then when I um, went into high school, I switched to percussion. Um, I begged my parents to let me go to Central Memorial High School instead of Western Canada High School because at the time they had a very good uh, marching program, which... Um, uh, sort of the, the legacy of Bob Eklund, which was carried on by another teacher named Bruce Taylor. Uh, and we went to, uh, we competed in the Winter Guard and Drumline International competitions in Las Vegas. We went to Europe, we went to Australia. Um, mm. Can I ask you a question about yeah, that? Because sure, I'm yeah. very interested and I've actually never, uh, I had a student uh, when I lived in Baton Rouge that, uh, that I taught and he was a student at the school, he was like 16, 17, and he was highly steeped in this. And I'll tell you, this guy had, you know, hand chops that, uh, that to this day I'm still struggling to, to achieve. Uh, yeah. it, so was it like a Blue Devils thing? Were you guys that sold out? Were you, you know what I mean? Like were you throwing each other sticks? And I mean, was it that crazy? What, what was that about? Very much modeled after Drum Corps International of which the Blue Devils is a part. There are other organizations. I mean, there's the Madison Scouts. There, there are a lot of drum corps. I marched with a drum corps in Calgary called Allegiance Elite, which doesn't exist anymore. but. Uh, we did a Drum Corps International tour all over the states in the summer of 1999. And uh, yeah, um, dynamics are largely measured in a visual sense as opposed to an auditory sense. Uh, your stick heights are measured. 
And the rudiments and the compound rudiments that you have to do are quite virtuosic and technically demanding. So um, um, I, I vividly remember, I mean, you know, I did Allegiance Elite for a year, and I did the Calgary Stampede Show Band in the Snare Line for two years, and I did Central Memorial for all three years. And then I vividly remember auditioning for the classical program at the University of Calgary. Um, I, I uh, got a free lesson from Glenn Price before uh, he was the percussion prof there at the time before my audition and he said well the good news is that you're going to be able to sight read any piece of snare drum music for the rest of your life but the bad news is that in terms of your technique and the rigidity of it we're going to have to rip everything down to square zero perhaps even square minus five and <laughs> rebuild right from the beginning because um, there's a lot of tension and you know you're measuring everything there's no flow there's no grace to your playing. <clears throat> There's no groove. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I, t I took that under advisement, and, and uh, Stampede Band was rehearsing every Tuesday nights. The University Orchestra was also rehearsing every Tuesday night. So I made the, the decision to leave Stampede Band, and, and I won the timpani spot in the University Orchestra when I was in first year. And I did that every Tuesday night for all four years of my degree, and um, um, I was able to sort of rest on the laurels of my marching chops to an extent while also stri striving to develop flow, musicality, relaxation, and um, struggle to overcome tension, which uh, for a lot of the marching percussion community, if you graduate into classical music eventually, the tension is a battle that you may or may not end up fighting with for the rest of your life in terms of physical tension, just physiologically healthy playing habits. But, uh, but, but in terms of the chops and the ability to read, material as a black pages as they go by at the speed of light it's uh, something that i'll always be thankful for uh-huh no doubt and sorry people but you know being a drummer and interviewing a drummer i'm gonna have to get into a little bit of this compound stickings compound rudiments yeah uh describe what, what kind of uh compound mm -hmm. rudiments would you be necessarily learning <clears throat> so um i mean uh, we're all familiar, I, well, not all of us, uh, you and I are familiar with the standard 26 drumming rudiments from the North American Rudimental Drumming Association, which has now been replaced by the, uh, the Percussive Arts Society. But uh, it's the same thing, the standard 26 drumming rudiments. Uh, one of them is a flam accent, where you, you just do three notes alternating, and you put a flam at the beginning of each group of three. Another one is the five-stroke roll. Uh, if you do it open, or as a double stroke, then you have a double stroke on the right, double stroke on the left and then a single stroke on the right, and then you do it the other way around. So if you compound those two together, and you do a flam accent, but you make the first two notes of the three notes double strokes, now you have what's called a flam five. Right. And um, so that's one example. Right, um, almost kind of akin to a bludgeda, if you know what a bludgeda is. Yeah. It's got the same vibe as a five, there's just less notes. Uh, there's four notes instead of five, and I, use the shit out of bludgeons <laughs> right. every chance I get because yeah. um, I love them. I mean, just that group of three, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just elevates, you know, the tension of the music uh, and then land on one and boom, there's your release. Right. So I know what you're talking about. And then you talk about rigidity. And yeah, I suppose, you know, rigidity is the the evil of groove. But all those chops that you gained, I would figure would have to account for something, you know, like even if you have to back up and go back to fluidity, finger control, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, molar technique, <clears throat> mm -hmm. learning how to play uh, loosely, you know, like where your muscle groups, you know, where your quarter note muscle group comes from and where your eighth note or whatever, and then down to 16th and 30 seconds in your fingers, all of those things, of course, adding to groove. Yeah, uh, but the but that ri that rigidity approach, I suppose, and everything that you learn through that, do you take that with you? Is it valuable to you? Oh, certainly. Uh, one of the main things that we talk about in the marching world is taps versus accents, and um, and you know I guess in the in the in the rest of the drumming world we just refer to that as accented notes versus non-accented notes, but really creating a significant differentiation between your non-accented volume and your accented volume. And um, I'll always remember something that Glenn Price said to me um, about playing, uh, you know, um, W.F. Ludwig solos and Charles Wilcoxon solos and things like that on snare drum. He would say, he, and, and, and this is, you know, something that comes from, um, just I'll go on a little bit of a tangent. I'll never forget when I met Evelyn Glennie, and uh, she was telling me about how um, <clears throat> when she was 11 or 12 years old, um, she, you know, wasn't really proper for... Uh, girl to participate in instrumental music programs in the grade school 
structure in Scotland. Um, and it definitely wasn't proper uh, to, for a girl to be a drummer. Her teacher gave her a snare drum and no sticks and no stand and sent her home with it. And so what she did was she experimented with every single different sound she could create on the snare drum with just her hands and her fingers. And she started talking about how you can produce melody on a snare drum. And um, um, it was around the same time, about 2004, I guess, when I was in my third year of my undergraduate, Glenn Price said something similar to me, and he said, consider your non-accented notes to be the accompaniment and your accented notes to be the melody. So now your accented notes are on this upper plane. You've always got the non-accented notes down here as your accompaniment, and then you're creating melodic contour with your accented notes. So you have to differentiate those from one another so that, so that the audience, even if they're not trained as percussionists or they're not trained musically at all, can, can, astout, can you know, recognize the difference between those two planes Get of dynamics. And I was like, you know, that's something that I learned in the marching world. Um, differentiating accents and taps, making the accents pop out and all be, otherwise always being disciplined volume-wise and bringing everything else down so that you just have this rhythmic undercurrent and this subdivision underneath the melody that you're producing. And, um, and so that's definitely something that I've taken from the marching world that uh, is quite possibly the biggest thing I've taken from the marching world that I love to apply to battery percussion, non-pitch percussion, um, and drum set being an example of that, but also Latin American and African percussion being examples of that. Right, so uh, that's very interesting. So even through the rigidity, you were still learning dynamics. Yeah. Yeah, like uh, to a great degree, and the importance of dynamics in terms of getting your point across, mm -hmm. you know, the, the difference between uh, melody and accompaniment. Uh, to, you know, to necessarily be musical, with your instrument as opposed to just a cacophony. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then of course in the orchestral world, you you know, when you're playing snare drum and you're playing, I mean, you know, some of the more difficult snare drum excerpts out there written by composers like Bela Bartok or Rimsky Korsakov, um, you really, really have to be careful and hold back because it's so easy to overpower absolutely everybody in the orchestra with a snare drum. So you get used to getting the hand from the conductor a lot earlier in your career. And then um, you learn how to establish a lot of dynamic creativity within a very compressed range. So, you know, um, I mean, the difference between triple piano and double piano uh, fundamentally is that the beads of your sticks move two millimeters more or less than they would normally move. Right. And if the bead of your stick is moving only a two millimeter uh, differential, then your hand is moving so much less than that. Um, <clears throat> so, so creating, creating dynamic, like you know, um, exploiting dynamic creativity within a very uh, small and compressed range of dynamics becomes very important, uh, certainly in the world of orchestral battery playing, and um, and uh, <laughs> it's important to not have too much coffee before you get to <laughs> rehearsal <laughs> because you need to have steady hands in order to pull that off. Well, and and I think I think for you, you know, we we you know like. The drummers that are out there, the players that are out there, whether you're a drummer or not, I think it's everybody's responsibility uh, to play with dynamics mm -hmm. and to have good time. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I know, you know, a lot of guitar players want to look at the drummer or the bass player uh, without any, um, without any, what's the word, necessary uh, accountability for their own sense of time or dynamic. Uh, I've run into that a time or two or a hundred. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, you know, but in this respect, I mean, you're getting down to the minutia of this. Uh, you know, what we all kind of consider playing the room mm -hmm. and playing to other musicians. So, in a sense, you are playing the room mm -hmm. uh, when you're having to be that dynamic and that to a a level that is not only perhaps a little bit more important, but certainly with with that sort of understanding going through your mind the entire time you're playing. Mm -hmm. Like, am I above? You know, we're in clubs, you can get a little bit loud and get a little bit over top of that, but there are so many more instruments, so many other instruments saying things, speaking things, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, melody coming from, you know, four different sides and counter melodies and everything yeah. else that you really have to know what it means to play your part, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. you got to fit into the texture. And you have to be sensitive to um, to other people in the room. Uh, a wise man once said to me, "You have twice as many ears as you have mouths, 
So you should probably do twice as much listening as you do contributing. Um, and that's true, obviously, conversationally, um, societally, um, sociologically, but it's also true in music. You, you, you know, the more people you're playing with, the more you need to really listen and play sensitively to the people around you, as opposed to just like, oh, I got this trick I could pull out right now, you know. Um, <laughs> God knows I'm not guilty of that. Oh, no, no, of course. <laughs> not even for a sec. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, it's been, you know, a long road for me, you know. Uh, in terms of my musical understanding, you know, to gain that uh, that conscientiousness where it mm -hmm. comes to dynamics mm -hmm. and uh, and what it means to step out of the way, yeah. to allow other people's voices to speak. That yeah. you know, that perhaps no. I mean, do I think the drummer should be part of the conversation all the time, every time? Well, of course. Otherwise, there's no point in having him or her or them there. Right? Exactly. They are part of the ensemble. Exactly, and I think that's even what came out of, you know, the, the bop era, post-bop era, mm -hmm. you know, was the fact that the drummer does have a voice. Yeah. And, you know, that every single part of the instrument, the hi-hat, stepping the hi-hat, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all these things are, are contributors to the voice and to the language that the drummer is speaking, and that they started to be taken seriously in that context. They just didn't keep time anymore. They were actually part of the conversation. And I'll tell you what, you know, when it comes down to me playing, uh, I love it when other musicians understand that from my perspective. Yeah. And so it really is a give and take, although in classical especially, I would suppose, you are there for a, a little bit more specific reason and you have to know that reason and be reminded of that almost every bar you play. Yeah, 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 for sure. What you were saying about the drum set having a voice in each instrument, uh, each surface of the drum set having um, having its own dedicated purpose. I mean, you know, Max Roach, Max Roach, uh, I maintain pioneered that movement a lot, and I really, really admire him for doing so. And uh, and Max Roach has a lot of um, you know has a has a really great reach as a drummer, where um, instrumentalists who are not drummers will listen to Max Roach and will talk about Max Roach specifically for that reason. It's quite rare for a drummer, you know, for, for almost every jazz saxophonist or for every blues guitarist you know, um, to, to, to know about somebody like that and to know how he expanded the scope of, of how an instrument, how an unpitched instrument can contribute melodically and harmonically. Um, but what you're saying about um, orchestral writing is true. One of the things I love about orchestral writing is that you have this cushion that the strings lay down. The strings are probably the instruments that are playing the majority of the time. The only instruments in the entire orchestra that are playing the majority of the time. The bassoon is reserved for the right moment that merits bassoon. The trombones are res reserved for the right moment that merits trombone. Likewise with percussion. And, so um, what you're saying is the string instruments are kind of like the guitar players of classical music? I suppose so, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Um, and guitar is a string instrument too. The classical approach, now that you do play a little bit of drum set, or more than a little bit, how has that impacted your understanding and what have you brought to these new forms of music that you're now uh, engaged in? Uh, well, I mean, I think a lot of what we've talked about um, already, for sure. Dynamic subtlety, um, taking opportunities to create melodic contour, and to shine on the instrument that you're playing and then knowing when to back out of the way so that other people can do it. So that, um, so that you're contributing to a process that I think of as exploiting the diversity of the ensemble. Um, you know when to get out of the way so that the other aspects of the ensemble can shine and you know when to um, come to the foreground and contribute a little bit more. Um, I mean, learning, learning drum set was always a little bit of a, um, I never, Early in my career, when I was still in university, I wasn't wild about it, really. I wanted to be a classical musician. I figured I was going to take over the world. And uh, Glenn Price sat me down at the end of my third year of my undergrad, and he said, you know, so what, what do you think you're going to do with yourself after, um, after university? And I said, well, I'm going to go do a master's, and then I'm going to do a PhD, and then I'm going to go to Toronto, and then I'm going to go to New York, and then I'm going to go to Tokyo, and I'm going to take over the world. And he said, no, you're not. No, you're not. Or at least... You're definitely not unless you learn drum set and you need to learn drum set if you're going to survive in the world as a percussionist 
And I said, well, then I guess that's what I have to do. So what do you think I should do? I mean, I was, I was really keen on doing independent studies when I was in university because you could substitute independent study credit for a senior elective. Um, you know, there were ways of, of, of doing that. You, you wrote up your own course outline, and I was like, well, then, Glenn, I'll do, a, I'll do an independent study with you in drum set. And he said, no, actually, there's somebody better you should study with. Um, uh, and he's the only guy in town that I'll give you university credit for studying with. And his name is Andy Erickson. And so oh, I went and took drum set lessons from Andy Erickson for about eight months. Cool. And the way that that guy could just, like, create melodic contour and then back off and lay down this silky smooth groove the whole rest of the time was great. The way that he could take a lick of three notes and move it around, regardless of whether it was in compound time or simple time, um, and just move it around the kit, regardless of whether he was playing um, rock or fusion, or whether he was playing samba and doing that crazy thing that Brazilians do that Andy Erickson can also do where he compresses the first three sixteenth notes together and stretches the fourth one out uh -huh. so that you get this really organic sense of pushing and pulling within a beat, but overall your tempo is rock solid. Yeah. Um, um, the drum set's a whole other world, man. Like it's 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 crazy, and uh, and I I, um, I consider myself very lucky. As you know, I don't consider myself to be a drum set specialist as the main thing that I do. But I consider myself very lucky that um, um, for the effort that I have put into uh, learning drum set, that I've had artists approach me and, and, um, and ask me if I could do a record with them. And I've done a couple. The blues one, one that you've talked about. And then I did a Celtic crossover fusion project as my other one. And that oh, was cool. a lot of fun, too. Well, that is cool. Um, and Andy Erickson, yeah, Andy and I, uh, I was brought into, yeah, whatever, the old uh, Rocky Mountain Christian school or something like that, uh, and Andy was teaching there. Okay. And so I was brought in mm -hmm. uh, alongside Andy to adjudicate the students uh, twice a year. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's kind of actually, except for listening to him, watching him play a few times, and I absolutely, I mean, you know, there's no words necessarily to describe Andy Erickson's playing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uniquely Andy, and it's so amazing. Mm -hmm. That marriage of, of schmutz, uh, and tightness, mm -hmm. you know, that loose, that duality, you know, mm -hmm. uh, is something Andy just was so great at. Chops all day long mm -hmm. by, I think, a master educator mm -hmm. and a masterful understanding of the instrument. And, you know, uh, one thing that I'll say, I mean, you and I, before this interview, were talking about competition. This period of competition, healthy competition versus unhealthy competition. Um, isn't it great that we're both drummers and we're sitting, having an agreeable talk, uh, conversation with one another. Um, you know, in the before times, sometimes people who, who play the same instruments as one another would sort of shy away from one another because they would see one another as being the competition, right? Right. I mean, um, if I'm a drummer and you're a drummer, then I'm co-op and you're Safeway. And we're competing with one another for the same client base. But um, during the pandemic, it's, it's made our activities a, a little more mutually exclusive in a really friendly way and we're all interested in learning from one another more. Do you so. think that that has something to do with with the necessary uh, delving into an understanding of our humanity? Just of the, of the sense that we now that we are alone all we necessarily have is ourselves and so I know for me it, during this time it's been uh, it's been an inevitable, uh, what would you say, an inevitable sort of coming together of, of, of being alone and thinking about what people actually mean, mm -hmm. uh, about what I mean mm -hmm. to the world, uh, to myself, mm -hmm. uh, the people that I interact with. And, and then, you know, outside of that, lots of things come into your mind, you know what I mean? Your own selfishness. Mm -hmm. the way that you have propagated yourself, meaning speaking to myself here, the way that I propagated myself in the world at the expense of other people. Mm. You know, like you said, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a uh, co-op in your safe way. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of think no frills, but uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, you're absolutely correct. And I think that, that this moment has given us pause in a sense to come back to, 
to ourselves and to ask ourselves, you know, some deep questions that we otherwise just could have flaked out on yeah. uh, because we were busy or we were at least excused ourselves by being busy. Mm-hmm. And now that we're not busy, we are asking those questions. We are asking, you know, uh, how have I propagated myself in this world? Have I been helping my brothers and sisters? Was I have any help to them prior to this? Mm. What does it mean to be a human being on this planet? Yeah. I think that's a big part of it, uh, for sure, for sure. And I think that you just outlined it very well. I don't think I need to say much more about that. But, uh, but I will say that um, I think that the, there's always been a sense of brotherhood and sisterhood, uh, personhood in the, commu- in the percussion community in particular um, that I've been spoiled by. And, uh, and that a large part of the reason why that is is because we all need to borrow instruments from one another. <laughs> like, you know, the, the, you can't possibly own everything as a percussionist. So um, we all sort of become aware of what one another has and we all do each other favors in terms of when somebody needs something. I mean, Celine Yohimis has a really nice vibraphone. I've been able to borrow her vibraphone for a few projects when I've needed it. Uh, Kyle Eustace has a beautiful glockenspiel. Um, I happen to own an orchestral bass drum. People borrow my orchestral bass drum when I need it, and you know, if Brent Van Dusen borrows my orchestral bass drum and then I need a really nice African drum for something, I know that I can go to him because he's an African drumming specialist. Um, he actually just moved to Vancouver recently, but uh, oh, but, but but, but yeah. I, I think that the percussion community uh, has always stayed in touch with one another and has always been um, maybe a little bit more inclined to, to help and support one another and do one another favors than, um, than the communities of other instrumentalists in the city, uh, just for that inherent reason. Well, that's an interesting observation that you're making. I always assumed, well, you know, once again, right, I mean, you have these, these, these different sort of pockets that, that are natural, I, I suppose, you know, like the, 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 uh, uh, the community of classical players, you know, uh, mm-hmm. and percussionists would sort yeah. of, you know, uh, hang out with, with, with themselves and borrow from themselves and do all the things you're talking about. Yeah. You know, the, the gigging drummer, drum set player. Yeah. Uh, you know, because it's, it's always been my thing that, like guys, you know, guys in, in the community push me. And I, I take the, like I do sense a, a certain element, or not sense it, I, I, I do think that there is a healthy competitive spirit that keeps me cutting edge, mm-hmm. that keeps me learning what the new guys know. Mm-hmm. You know, if I listen to Andre, you know, I always mm-hmm. hear something new. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Andy, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, there's no lack there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's so many players out there and so I guess, you know, if the gig came down to who wants to get the gig, well, of course I want to get the gig. You know what I mean? Like, I want to try my hardest to get that gig. I don't not want to. Mm-hmm. But that has no bearing on what I think of my fellow man. Yeah. You know course. what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and guys like Ange, uh, Andy, uh, oh, my God, I'm going to miss some of you or the majority of you, but you know who you are and you know I love you. Yeah. <clears throat> We've always understood you know the, the 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 humanity in each other and that that is separate necessarily from what we do yeah and so we've always pushed each other to grow you know uh, i think Ange asked me <clears throat> about the rudimental ritual uh the alan dawson's rudimental ritual the 86 and uh and i've had conversations with the guys about that you know i'll ask Ange about you know whatever he plays on a saturday evening you know yeah. uh, like what the hell was that you know can you break that down for me all these things so I've always sensed a level of, of humanness with, within the drumming community, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, and the ability to separate the gig from the man. Right. And, and I love that about the guys that I know. Yeah, yeah and I can appreciate wanting to separate the, the humanity aspect from the work aspect, but I think that there's something that mends the scene between those two, which is humility. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, we, we have... Uh, as you said, we have a lot of really great players in the city who are really, really good at certain things. And I mean, when I hear, I mean, of course, I, I love to be called to play drum set for sure. But I, I also understand that drum set was never my main thing from the get go. And when I hear that Kent McRae has gotten the kind of gig that Kent McRae is perfect for, or Ange has gotten the kind of gig that Ange is perfect for, I go, oh man, that's going to be an awesome show. I'm so glad that he got that gig mm-hmm. because that's the right man for the job. 
<clears throat> totally. So, yeah. Totally. Uh, I feel that way, you know, about uh, a guy like John McCaslin. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, like I'm so thankful when they don't call me for that gig. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm like, no, no, no. You call John for that, man. Yeah, yeah, like John's sure. the cat. Yeah. And and so you're right. It's that humility. But hey, don't you think that humility is a necessary aspect to being good? Oh, of course. Yeah, of course. Because if if you're not humble, you're not willing to learn. Right. Um, you, humility is a prerequisite to being receptive to new ideas. And one can only diversify one's own perspective through the exchanging of perspective with other perspectives. And that's true in sociology, and it's true in the arts. Right. Um, I do want to get to other aspects of this, uh, to, you know, our conversation and the reason that you're, you know, that you and I are conversing today. Mm -hmm. uh, and those have, you know, necessarily to do with, with the cultural aspect of music the civic nature of music, mm. uh, the collectivization of each other, the, mm -hmm. the sort of thing that we're discussing in terms of pockets of, of disciplines where drummers get together. You know, I think artists overall uh, need to be together. You know, I think that we drive each other. You know, once again, that humility that drives us. You know, when you hear or you see somebody doing a better job, you want to know, what is that? What yeah. am I lacking? What am I missing? Yeah. And... And I don't know, I get excited when I start talking about bringing people together. Mm -hmm. And I know that part of what you're doing out there in the real world is having an, an impact on that, or is at least, you know, sort of pointing the finger to, to come this way, you know, um, to make people, I don't know, just more uh, comfortable in their own lives, in their standard of living, so that they don't necessarily have to, what? Have to be so focused on, oh my God, how am I gonna survive? So that they can have the time and the necessary tools to create. Mm -hmm. uh, because we all know, you know, whether you're a singer, songwriter, or you're a drummer learning a, a lick, or you're, uh, you know, anything, these things take time and they take, not only that, but the emotional ability to relax your mind, to know that everything outside of you is well. Mm -hmm. So that you actually can have an, not an excuse, but the absolute reason to sit and create. Well, let me just interject yeah. and, and just say one thing. I mean, yeah. we work in the arts, so we're emotionally invested in what we do, um, which means that there are going to be peaks and valleys. The more emotionally invested we are in what we do, the higher up we get and the lower down we get at the same time. Um, you know, we can compare and contrast this to, uh, I don't want to rip on accountants, so I'll, I'll, I'll give credit to Monty Python's caricature of chartered accountants where, where <laughs> they're the most boring people in the world, so maybe your peaks and valleys look like this if you fit into the um, personification, the caricaturized personification by Monty Python of a chartered accountant. But if you're a professional musician or a dancer or an actor or a visual artist, then it's going to be more like this. And I think that um, the lower somebody gets um, when they're going through a tough time, particularly during the pandemic, uh, the more supportive we should be of that person because the more support we offer somebody, when they're in a valley, the higher their next peak is going to be. In respect to that, uh, I think you're absolutely right. In, in terms of what we have been experiencing, you have been doing some work or a lot of work with these, uh, these certain political entities that you know, we can talk about. Uh, I want to talk right now about Bill 75. And what I would like you to do, for my sake and I'm sure for the listener's sake, is explain in a, like I'm two years old in a sandbox, what, what Bill 75 is. What does it mean as an artist? What is the good that can come of that? Go ahead and, and, and talk about that. All right, well, uh, I mean, Bill 75 is, um, is a step forward, and it's a surprising step forward. Um, given the fact that, you know, given what I think most of us who work in the arts uh, generally think of the United Progressive Conservative Party and their cabinet and, um, and how progressive they are versus how regressive they are when it comes to um, looking at public education, the way they treat health care, their stewardship of the environment, etc. But um, uh, there's, a, there's the current Minister of Culture, which is the most rel relevant cabinet portfolio to what we as artists do for a living. Uh, um, his name is Ron Orr. He's loved classical music for all of his life. Uh, he transports his 
three grandchildren to and from violin lessons every week for which he pays um, with an excellent violin instructor who is in the union. Her name is Naomi Delfield. She's the concert master of the Red Deer Symphony Orchestra. And Ron Orr um, looked at um, essentially income disparity between artists and the mean of the rest of society. So he went, you know, this is how much of an art, this is how much an artist with high school makes. This is how much an average, um, th this is the average of what people with high school make in any other industry in the province. This is how much an artist with one university degree makes. This is how much somebody with one university degree or one trade ticket um, makes on average in, the, uh, in all the rest of the professions that are in the province. And we need to find a way to, um, to close that gap. Um, sorry, that way. <laughs> and uh, um, so I think, I think that you know, the spirit of what he is trying to do is very good. Um, and that's the best way that I can explain it in layman's terms. Uh, the uh, layperson's terms, I should say. Uh, but um, does the bill not go far enough? No, it doesn't go far enough. Um, the bill, um, what it does so far is um, it um, mandates that a paiga, not a pega, which is uh, not to be confused with a pega, which is probably more of a common household name. That's the engineers and, and geoscientists union. But a paga, A P A G A, uh, stands for Alberta Pub Public Agencies Governance Act. So any organization that falls under that umbrella uh, has to treat an artist a certain way. So the, these are uh, institutions that are publicly funded and or that operate out of a government building. So I mean I think that the the probably the most ubiquitous example in terms of what people will know would be anything that operates out of Arts Commons because Arts Commons is a government building. So that's the Calgary Philharmonic Orchestra, Theatre Calgary, Alberta Theatre Projects, One Yellow Rabbit, etc. Those organizations have to treat artists well. They already treated artists fairly well because generally they're hiring people who are members of professional associations such as the AF of M, IATC, uh, Equity, ACTRA, etc. Um, and um, AFM you know, being the American Federation of Musicians. Okay, Our which union. is the union? The Musicians Union. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Calgary Musicians Association is a local of that. Um, okay. uh, the other thing that it does is that it um, it mandates that artists are legally entitled to a contract. So if you like, as soon as anybody phones you, you are legally within your rights to re to request a contract and to be issued a contract. Unfortunately, you're not legally within your rights to challenge the client if the client decides that that's a turnoff and decides to go with somebody else who doesn't request a contract. But you are entitled to a contract anytime you work as an artist. Um, but there's a lot that it doesn't do. I mean, if you're working for an agency that does not follow under a PEGA, um, like a bar or a club or a restaurant or whatever, they're not mandated to be able to provide you a certain minimum standard scale at all. Um, it's up to us to negotiate for that as, uh, as a casual engagement worker, as a freelancer. You have to negotiate that so that the onus is still on you. So what could that bill do to do more? Well, um, minimum wage is a provincially regulated thing. Um, as such, Bill 75 could go further and establish a minimum service fee for an artist, for a performing artist, as, um, a, as a minimum standard. And as such, if you're a club owner or a bar owner, you must pay people this much. Right, and that, of course, would be would have to necessarily be <clears throat> more than just fifteen dollars an hour, would, would you think? Because no, no, yeah, it would be a per yeah. service rate. Yeah, that would take that would, and you know, I, I think I think that uh, the standard, uh, certainly the the aspects of the union tariff that with which I'm the most familiar are the, are the orchestral tariff, which which says that a, a service is two and a half hours with a 20 minute break included in it. You get this much for the service. Obviously it's more than $15 per hour, but it takes into consideration the amount of preparation that one had to do in order to get ready for that service. And it takes into consideration the amount of you know logistical work that has to happen on either side of that service in order to make that service happen. Um, with respect to negotiating the, you know, um, hustling the gig in the first place and then negotiating the rate for the gig, transporting your instrument to and from the gig, um, um, stage grooming, you know, making sure that you look good on stage. And if if you have to, some sometimes you have to do makeup. Sometimes you have to do uh, costuming or or you know wear something. I mean, 
I certainly went into debt to buy my first tuxedo. <laughs> so, so, um, so, so that's something there. But uh, other, other, um, other things that the bill could do. Um, well, let me stop you just oh, right yeah, there, sure. just for a sec. Yeah. You know, you know a lot about this, but but as you bring up certain aspects of it, I immediately get intrigued, and and then I have a question as a layman, or I put myself in the place of, let's say, a bar owner. So, I'm a bar owner. All right. Yeah. What, what number one, what incentive is there for me to necessarily buy in to this, or is this something that could disrupt my ability uh, to uh, to keep my bar viable? You know, to keep it open. If I have to pay, let's say I have to pay. I don't know, man. I mean, you know, what's fair? We know that that in terms of uh, inflation, you know. From the '70s up until now, a uh, a typical musician playing a bar gig, just a bar gig, would, uh, on average, I think it's around six fifty, for the for the gig. If if we factor in inflation and all those things, mm -hmm. and the rise of of uh, of other certain factors, mm -hmm. that we'd be we'd be making about six fifty. Now we're probably not going to make six fifty. No. Uh, although that would seem not necessarily unfair, mm -hmm. given those certain rates. Mm -hmm. um, so what incentive would there be for a bar owner to desire to partake? Is there a, a certain thing, because we're dealing with a lot these days, is there a certain fluctuation between mandate and, and benefit that could be had? Of course there is. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, well, there definitely is. I mean, you get what you pay for um, with respect to the quality of workmanship. And, um, and people's attitudes when they come and work for you, how happy they are to be there. And when I say you get what you pay for in terms of quality of workmanship, to an extent that, that, that means you're going to get more qualified and, and better people with a higher degree of workmanship. But to an extent, it also means that people are just going to be happier to show up and work for you because they feel that they're being fairly compensated. Mm. They're going to be willing to go the extra mile. They're, um, they're going to be more inclined to just no, go. go I mean, that's, that's just inspiring to me in the in this sense. You know, when you go back to the eighties, seventies, eighties, right? Yeah. There were A rooms, B rooms, C rooms, right? Yeah. In order to play an A room, you had to be of a certain curation. You know, mm -hmm. you had to be so good mm -hmm. to do an A room. So, mm -hmm. in a sense, what I hear you saying could almost be, and I hate to say return to that because that'll make me sound old, but it could be you know, a way in order to bring back a level of curation to the clubs. Like, if you want to have a gig, well, you got to be this tall to ride. Mm -hmm. Am I, am I, is I, that a correct assumption? I, I, think, I think that that's part of it, but I think that the lay person who doesn't necessarily understand that echelon of rooms, A rooms, B rooms, and the arts, and, and, and you know, if, if we're looking back to the 70s, for example, if you don't get that, then in this age of information on the internet, you don't have to look very far to understand, um, to, to, you know, to, to, to find the, um, the discrepancy between what Walmart pays their employees and what Costco pays their employees, and how happy Walmart workers are to go to work and how much more functional they are in the work environment versus Costco employees. Or you can look at Tim Hortons versus Starbucks. Or you can look at any degree, any variety of institutions like that where they're simply treating their employees better and they're compensating their employees better. And they're getting more out of their employees and their employees are happy to be there, which fosters more of a creative and, or, um, creative and cooperative spirit in the workplace uh, where people collaborate and they help one another and they exchange ideas and perspectives with one another. Um, I mean, I, I've been... I've been on a variety of gigs, and you know, particularly early in my career, I was working for substandard pay every so often, and every so often I would luck out and I would get paid very well. And the attitudes of people um, when they're being compensated well are miles apart from the attitudes of people when they're being compensated the bare minimum or even below that. So I think that that would be a good incentive for um, you know, for for an average venue owner to compensate their musicians fairly, um, or their their you know their their performers fairly in general. Yeah. Uh, so I love what you what, what what you're saying, and I love the statement that well, you get happier employees. And I think that that absolutely, you know, I mean, we're seeing it, right? You know, they call it the Great Resignation, or you know, whatever, right? 
but people are resigning. People are walking away, uh, you know, especially in the States. Uh, you know, you have uh, Starbucks unions opening up. Mm -hmm. You know, that's never taken place. Mm -hmm. It's never happened. You have Amazon, mm. and you have them unionizing. Yeah, and I wish them luck. Yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, they deserve it, man. Yeah, I mean, do. nobody deserves. Uh, and I know that it's not replete with this, but, you know, just in January, two people uh, died in an Amazon warehouse, mm. of which, of which the parameters of these two individuals was that if you leave, you're fired. Mm -hmm. And so they died at, at, at the warehouse uh, because they, you know what I mean? I mean, mm -hmm. that's the pressure. Mm -hmm. And that is absolutely human that you might, you know what I mean? How do you make a decision like that? Well, my family, you know, I mean, my wife's going to divorce me if I drive home at 1230. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, my kids aren't going to have anything to eat. I'll stay. Mm -hmm. And then I die. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think that we are so far away from just our basic human understanding uh, that it's, it, it's frightening mm -hmm. uh, in that respect. But, you know, my question as to the, the owners, is there any way to incentivize, say, a bar owner, club owner, <clears throat> to, outside of the fact that people, you know, are more satisfied with the money they're getting, is there any way to incentivize them if they say, look, all I want is for people to be happier, but in exchange for their happiness, I'm going to go out of business. Uh, do you think, number one, that's a relevant argument? And number two, if, if it is in any respect, is there an incentive that you can think of for it's an a, owner? It's a relevant argument. Uh, and beyond the, um, the, the sort of feel-good incentives that I've already mentioned, um, there's legislation that's worked perfectly well in the past that we could bring back. Um, in the heyday of Tommy Banks in Alberta, it was actually a, f a, a formalized and mandated directive from the Alberta Gaming and Liquor Commission that if your bar had live music, you could stay open later and you could serve alcohol later. If your bar did not have live music, you had to close down earlier. There's a great incentive. That is a good incentive. And it worked. It worked for a long time. We could bring that back. And that's an amendment that could be proposed to the bill. And it's very precedented for amendments to happen. I mean, the curriculum bill, or the bill that governs the uh, school curriculum in Alberta is being amended constantly. The bill that governs open pit coal mining in Alberta is being, is, is being amended constantly. Um, the bill that uh, caused the shutdowns of the elbow and barrier visitor centers in Kananaskis country was amended such that those visitor centers are now reopened and have been restaffed. Um, we, we can bring up issues like that that will make sense, that will give incentives to everybody to enhance um, uh, live entertainment in the province, not just to the artists, where it's like, oh, sweet, now we have more gigs, and now we can, and now we can do the gigs more often, and we can get paid more for the gigs that we're doing, but that will also incentivize venue owners. Obviously, you have to offer incentives to venue owners, otherwise, it's, it's just not going to happen. It's not going to have any teeth. It's not going to have wheels. It's not going right. forward. Mm -hmm. Here's an idea, and it's not my own. Uh, you know, I can't take credit for this. But what if we incentivized that civically, the owners, uh, with things like, like tax breaks on their, uh, you know, on their property? You know what I mean? Then maybe they end up saving, I don't know, maybe not exponentially. And mm -hmm. trust me, I don't own a club. Mm -hmm. I have no stake in this is where clubs are concerned. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking that if I think from the club's aspect, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from their point of view, they're going to say, yeah, but there's nothing in it and I'm going to lose, man. Right, right. So what if it is, what is, what if they don't lose? What if there is a way out of that? Tax write-off incentives? Great idea. That's a fundamentally conservative philosophy. Uh, and uh, is, is, uh, is that, is that um, a government... Um, one fundamental way of, of stimulating an industry is to offer stakeholders within that industry tax breaks. We've seen that in the oil industry, the energy industry, um, and we're starting to see it in, um, in the industry of renewable energy. Um, we're starting to see it in, um, um, and that's more on the provincial level, the, the ones that I just mentioned. Um, on the uh, municipal level, we're starting to see it um, within the scope of a plan to revitalize the downtown core. Um, offering tax incentives to building owners to um, convert office spaces downtown into residential spaces. 
um, uh, not only tax incentives to, but grants in order to do that so that we have people living downtown in the in, in the outrageous amount of empty office space that we have now that everybody's been working from home and now that companies are figuring out that it's fine to have people working from home it works they were forced to figure that out but now they have figured that out and they've realized that they don't have to spend you know thirty thousand dollars per month or upwards for corporate rent in the core and that's why we have so much empty office space so the cities realize that we have to do something about that and they've offered tax incentives to building owners why wouldn't we offer tax incentives to club owners to pay musicians well. Um, they're doing it for so many other industries. Why not do it for the arts? If the government, in fact, is committed to, um, to fostering the arts industry and to growing the arts industry in the province, then why wouldn't we do that? And um, um, not only have I read this bill, Bill 75, but I've also read every single reading of the bill, which is public, it's all public domain, it's all. Where does somebody go to get that? Can I put that in the link? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, you can put the link in, and if you just want to look it up, just type into an online search platform, alberta.ca space, space bill seventy five, and then you can go to a page that gives you a very um, vague outline of the bill. But then you can actually click on the bill itself, and when you click on the bill itself, all of the readings, um, November through December, are listed as PDF documents, and you can go in. It's a lot of reading, but in those readings, um, you know, it was a lot of. It, it was a lot of conservative politicians getting up in the legislative assembly and talking about how great the arts industry is and how we should advocate the growth of the arts industry. They didn't really talk about how. So it's up to stakeholders, artists and club owners included, so ex to explain propose... St explain stakeholders for people that might not understand what that means. People who have a vested interest in the growth of the industry. Um, such as? Such as artists and such as club owners and venue owners and such as uh, people who govern organizations um, that operate um, uh, both within and outside of the scope of um, APAGA um, and, um, and also advocates of artists, um, patrons of the arts, people who support the arts, people who believe that the arts are important. It's up to them to pitch ideas and um, I, I mean fundamentally the arts industry is not the energy industry. We don't have a round table of lobbyists the way the energy industry does. We have to be our own lobbyists and we have to come up with creative solutions. And we have to propose those solutions to the people who will listen. And as I said earlier in the interview, we have a culture minister who loves the arts, who is willing to listen now. Hmm. If we have ideas, now's the time. That, my friend, is one of the reasons I'm sitting here with you today uh, because when you and I talked, you know, for the first time, right, like a week ago, a week and a half ago, uh, you know, like I, like I alluded to before, you know, you said, well, talk to your MLA. And I'm like, yeah, no, no, this, this, people need an understanding of this. Our community needs an understanding of this. Why? Because I think it, number one, it's okay to bitch. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. I think it's okay to complain. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know what I mean? If something's been done to you, you're allowed, like I said, to say, ouch, that hurts, mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, but I also believe that once that pain has subsided, now you have to stop bitching. And if somebody has a way to alleviate your pain, you might want to take them up on it. So that's, you know, one of the greatest reasons outside of you, the person, Rob Masiak, it's one of the reasons I had you on today, on this show, and is just sitting to talk to you, mm -hmm. because, because we have complained in the past, and that's been justified. But now that you're saying, you know, there are actual things that people that are only just bitching, mm -hmm. complaining, can do, mm -hmm. well, now it seems to me like we don't have a, uh, an excuse just to sit around. So it would be phenomenal to find out, certainly individualistically, what every individual can do <clears throat> individually. But it might also be interesting to add, just to ask you, do you have any idea how this may look in a collectivized sense? In terms of what people can do collectively, I mean, volume of communication to, the, to those who regulate is important. 
And um, in terms, you know, people sitting around complaining and how that doesn't accomplish anything, I think that a lot of complaints that people have are valid, and I think that a lot of what people are saying is is uh, is intellectually well thought out and has a lot of good data behind it. The problem is, is that they're just posting it on social media. They're not actually sending any of that to the people who make the decisions and who make legislation that could, in the end, enhance our industry. And when I see brilliant posts on Facebook, I just, I just pull my hair out and I think, could you please just take that, copy it, paste it into an email, and send it in to the people who actually make the decisions at the government level. It's so easy to do. It's not that hard to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are lots of people in our industry and advocates of our industry and venue owners who are having who have great things to say, but then when I talk to, to to the Minister of Culture, he's not hearing any of that. Right. Well, all, all we have to do is tell him. He's, he's ready and willing to listen. And, uh, and, and a lot of us, when we complain, we say good things. And you, you, don't have to, you don't have to do all the reading. You don't have to read the entire bill. You don't have to read all of the readings of the bill, which is hundreds of pages, I can tell you. But um, you, you, did, you know, if you think that there is an inequity in the industry, and you think, and and especially if you think that there's a solution, and if, or if you think there's, you know, you have a solution, you have an idea about how we can move things forward and grow the industry, and have uh, people treated more fairly in the industry, then like for God's sakes, bring up the solution. Um, lots of people have great solutions that I haven't even thought of. Like just now, you brought up tax write-off incentives. I hadn't considered that. As soon as you said that, I was like, well, of course. Why didn't I think of that? We're already, the government's already offering tax incentives to so many other industries. They clearly, and like everybody who spoke about this bill in the readings of the bill, wants the arts industry to grow and realizes that the arts industry stimulates the tourism industry, which stimulates the energy industry. Everything comes back. I mean, I, I talked, uh, when I was interviewed by Mayor Jyoti Gondek a while ago, I talked about the fact that um, it was Patty Pond, the president and chief executive officer of the Calgary Arts Development Authority, talked about how the arts industry brings $58.1 million of, um, of collateral, peripheral money into the economy. And that's just not, that's not even in terms of people buying concert tickets. That's in terms of people driving here, purchasing fuel, getting a hotel room, um, purchasing meals, purchasing alcohol. Um, it, it, it totally stimulates tourism and it totally stimulates um, uh, the energy industry and it, therefore it stimulates the economy. Why wouldn't we offer tax incentives to stakeholders in the performing arts industry in order to make that happen? It makes all the sense in the world. Right. So you should write in about that gap. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. I mean, that is a part of it. I think that the, you know, to play devil's advocate, there are people going to say, well, you know, Jesus, we do this. You know what I mean? Like, this is the government we're talking about. I suppose that if enough people wrote in, I get that, that, you know, change may come sooner. Uh, it may come quicker. Yeah. Uh, but I, I can understand people's frustration going, oh, God, you know, the government. This is one aspect and a huge aspect. I mean, number one, Bill 75 is is a good thing, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think the, your statement, it doesn't go far enough, is also true. Mm -hmm. um, because it doesn't seem to necessarily be affecting people that are, that are also necessarily affected. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in order for that to happen, because, you know, there was another thing brought up at this, the, the, the union uh, town hall. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was Coates that brought it up, perhaps. But said something about, you know, like a lot of the, the, the Calgary Arts stuff, you know, or, you know, the, the, a lot of the gigs and things like that that, that, that are coming into Calgary yeah. uh, are coming from outside of Calgary, that the players are coming from Vancouver or mm -hmm. they're coming from Toronto mm -hmm. uh, and that, they're, they're, that there are corporate musical entities out there uh, sort of, you know, vying for those positions and putting uh, their musicians from different provinces in into the uh, whatever gigs are, are going on here mm -hmm. and necessarily taking local artists out of that equation, which I find very interesting and probably counter uh, productive. Mm. And so, you know, that's another thing, I think, where we do need to collectivize mm -hmm. to take care of 
each other first, our own mm -hmm. tribe, you know what I mean? Before mm -hmm. we necessarily go out to other tribes mm -hmm. and just bring those people in because perhaps they have the best product, but perhaps they don't have the best product. We're just not shopping locally. Yeah. And that is a problem, man. I mean, that's what people I think would be frustrated about. Go ahead. Well, that's a, that's a great that's a great point, and and there's there's a lot of good product locally. There are a lot of great musicians in Calgary, and uh, the union has already, to a large extent, stepped up to the plate and ensured that clients shop locally. I mean, when Wicked came to town, they had to use the vast majority of the musicians had to be local people. They're not allowed to tour with absolutely everybody in their pit. They had to come in. They could have a few key members of their pit be local they had to hire local musicians. Jeremy Coates is one of them, um, because he brought his name up earlier. Um, when National Geographic comes to town, they have to hire a local orchestra. Uh, Diana Krall had to hire a local orchestra when she came to town. So does music from The Legend of Zelda. So does Video Games Live. They all have to hire local people. It's great the union has already stepped up to the plate in that regard. But what Jeremy brought up in the town hall meeting about um, bringing, you know, um, about uh, entities out of province, having such a great deal of control over, over um, uh, utilization of local personnel versus utilization of personnel from abroad. That's something that the union could step up to the plate uh, with respect to, and that's, uh, that's, that's an issue that the union can, can approach minister or about. And cabinet ministers do need to hear from stakeholders. I mean, it's great for a whole bunch of little guys like you and me to write in, but, uh, but, but if we can actually push the union to take an advocacy initiative with the government, um, then the union would have more clout and would have more power. Well, that's my whole point <clears throat> about the union, and I, I don't mean to shit on the union here, but what I am saying is that it's value for dollar, I think, mm -hmm. is part of it, right? So mm -hmm. when you have, you know, the union where you have to pay dues and, you know, you, you have to give your money to them, mm -hmm. and in return, historically, through a certain epoch of time, mm -hmm. you haven't been getting the return on your dollar. I think that that's where the union could make an impact is on the very thing that you're saying that, mm -hmm. you know, if, if I pay you 250 a year, mm -hmm. I'm gonna make, I don't know, 15 grand a year. Mm. That is value. Now, the union, I know, has said, well, it's not our responsibility to get you a gig. But then, in respect to that, that's kind of what people want. If, if the union could help in that respect uh, and order those things to a certain degree, uh, then you might feel like paying into something that you're getting something out of. It's just that for a while now, not just a short while, it seems like uh, people aren't getting... Uh, the value back that they are putting in. And maybe that's because of clubs. Maybe that's because, you know, clubs have undercut. And, and, and we've done it to ourselves. I know that too. And mm -hmm. that is a problem, the fact mm -hmm. that we have undercut each other mm -hmm. and sort of, you know, mutually assured our destruction. I get it. Um, but what's, what's, what do you say about that, about the union, you know, bringing these things in? I think the union does help, and the union are willing to help. Um, they're just not going to come knock on the door of your house and give it to you on a silver platter. You have to ask. Um, when I taught music for, um, for the Canadian Armed Forces, um, for, the, for a couple of summers I had a really good manager, a guy working above me who was able to always get results from upper management, from, from the very top, the people running the entire training center. And at one point I went to him and I was like, you know, how do you do this? Uh, how do you pull this off? And he said, I asked. That's how you get things. You ask for things. And I tried to really import that attitude into my entire life. And, you know, in my, the earlier part of my career, I had a certain amount of resentment towards the union. And I thought, you know, um, I even told students of mine who were going pro, they said, when should I join the union? And I said, when you get called for a collective agreement gig. Until then, don't join the union. The second the CPO calls you, or Calgary Exhibition of Stab Heat, or CBC, or City TV, or whatever, the second they call you, say yes to the gig, hang up the phone, pick it up one second later, call the union, and give them your credit card number. Um, only then do you, have an ex do you have a reason to join the union. But, I mean, it's, you know, his name is Mark Michalak. He's a saxophonist, actually, that manager I was talking about when I was, when I was teaching for the military. Um, 
as soon as he said that to me, I started to try to import that attitude into my life. And I tried to, um, I, I, I decided to test it out on my dealings with the union. So every once in a while when I wanted advice on negotiating or I wanted advice on hustling or I wanted to have input into the tariff or something like that, I would phone the union office and Doug Coos would listen to me. And he's a wealth of information and he always had great answers to my questions. And if he didn't have the right answers to my questions, he would refer me to somebody who definitely did. He'd refer me to an agent or he'd refer me to an entertainment lawyer like Wayne Logan, who is another wealth of information and who the union has on retainer. We can ask him questions whenever we want. We have access to contracts. The union is full of information. They're not necessarily going to give you 100% of the help that you want at any given moment, but neither is anybody in any aspect of the world in any walk of life. But the union is there to provide a great deal of information and a great deal of help and insight into how to be innovative. And uh, I think that all you have to do is ask them. And we have a new full-time secretary treasurer, and she's great at listening. And uh, her name's Trisha Edwards. Right. And and um, and that's why she started up these town halls to get input from 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 people. And uh, lately, I've been sending her some information about some of the things that you and I, Gavin, have been talking about in this interview. Every time I send her a piece of information, she thanks me. And any time I ask her for a piece of information, she not only gives me the information or she tracks it down and then gets back to me with it, but she thanks me for asking. And that cooperative and that cooperative relationship exists between musicians and the union. It's just that the union is not going to bring it to your door on a silver platter. You have to ask. Yeah. Is that enough? value for me to, you know, just the necessary, you know, thank yous and everything, which are important. Mm -hmm. Is there something that the union could be doing more that the union, that unions do? Um, my advice would be to call the union and ask them. Explain your situation and ask them for some advice. I mean, they have a wealth of, of they've been around forever. They have life members, they have honorary members, people who, you know, like people like Ian Tyson, who have really made it. Uh, they have um, people who have auditioned successfully for orchestras. They have people who have really made it well out on the beat as, uh, as, as, um, as club players and casual engagement workers, call them and ask them. Explain your unique situation to them and call them and ask them. And I mean, I said earlier in the interview, you, you get what you pay for, but you also have to use what you pay for. Um, if somebody objects to the fact that they have to pay $260 a year for a union membership, or somebody objects to the fact that they have to buy out of casual engagement dues every year, on, over and above the 260 or whatever it is now for a membership, um, then maybe they should be going to the union and asking, in a, obviously in a respectful and constructive way, but in an, in an inquisitive way and in an interesting way, asking the union, um, you know, what, what, what advice do you have for me? What help can you give me? How can you help me help myself? How can you help me help my colleagues? Um, most of the time when I, go to the or sorry, when I go to the union with that kind of an inquiry, I get insightful information. Trish, you know, who is brand new to the post mm -hmm. uh, that she inhabits now, uh, she's always been nothing but benevolent, understanding, listens, uh, kind, all those things. And so thusly, I, I approach her hopefully with the same spirit. Mm -hmm. um, and it could also be that the union might say that's a great thought or that, that's a great point and we don't necessarily have an answer. Well, the union needs to learn, and the union's willing to learn. The, the musicians' union is a very unique union as unions go, uh, because most of the time when you have a union, you have, you have one union representing you know, 1,000, 10,000, 50,000 employees to one employer. With the musicians' union, um, in our local, I think we have about 500, 550-ish members uh, with several thousand prospective employers, and, and the, the kinds of work that you can do for various types of employers uh, when you're in the music field are spread so far and wide that the union constantly has to try to, 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 to strive to be aware of all kinds of different working circumstances and working environments. And until the members actually bring those circumstances to the table, the union might not even be aware of them in the first place. And that's not necessarily the union's fault. Like we've got one full-time employee, one part-time employee, and and um, <clears throat> you know how can you possibly expect them to keep aspect of, or uh, expect them to keep track of what 
of all of the inner workings of the orchestral world and the broadcasting world and the, uh, the private event world and the public event world and the African drumming world and the Latin American drumming world and the jazz world and the R&B world and the rock world and the collaborating with dancers world and the theater world and the, you know, everything? Like, come on. Yeah. Y you know, th that's, that's crazy. You can't expect that out of anybody. Absolutely. You can't expect that out of any organization. So it's the responsibility of the member. The member is paying a certain amount of money to keep this organization afloat and they have a working consideration that they don't think that the union is aware of. Then tell Tell you. That is our responsibility. It is our responsibility, you know, to to hear from one another, to mm -hmm. hear what the pain is. You know, I, th I thought that in a, in a certain respect, that's kind of what the union exists for. There needs to be dialogue. Like, that's what people want. People want to be heard. They want to know that somebody has their back. And then they want to work, hopefully, within that structure. Everyone, mm -hmm. not just the union. <clears throat> yeah. Right? It's not the union and the one or two people it's everybody. You're right. Yeah. You're right. And, 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 and people love to vent to everybody besides the party who can do something about it. Like if somebody has, if people have a problem with Gavin Sorosian or if people have constructive feedback for Gavin Sorosian, Gavin Sorosian will be the last person to hear about it. <laughs> Absolutely everybody else will hear about it. I'm Human heard, nature, my friend. And, and, and come to me with complaints about the union. And people complain to everybody but the union about the union. Um, if you want to offer constructive feedback um, to, like, if you want your constructive feedback to be taken into consideration with respect to how to move forward, then you have to take that constructive feedback to the operative party. Go to the source, right? Go to the source, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think you're right. And, and I think that's exactly what I'm saying. You know, uh, we can't assume that, that we know, or, or the, the, the union can't even assume that, it, that people have a problem unless people tell them there's a problem. Yeah. Uh, and I, of course, I mean, that, that is just complete and utter sense. Yeah. Uh, and in that respect, you know, I think that that's where, well, I don't know. I mean, you like to look down the road yeah. and think that potentially, uh, you know, there is a way to solve a lot of the not only the problems, but the ways that we are feeling right now in this epoch of time. Yeah. You know what I mean? In our in the situation that is very real to all of us. Yeah. And I would love to see a greater uh, collectivism in this city. Mm -hmm. I think that it's far, t uh, you know, it's beyond the time. And, I, and I'll tell you what, you know, this is honest. I, I moved back to Calgary from... Uh, Baton Rouge in 95 mm -hmm. and I spent three years in Baton Rouge uh, getting to know the, the the kind of the American system of music and art and how things are are done and there was such a <clears throat> a sense and maybe you don't get this in every geography in the, in the states but where I was there was if you could play and if you were good if you had something to offer man you were accepted everywhere all the time boom Right? And um, I will never forget, and this might sound, uh, I don't know, uh, dramatic, but it's the truth. I got off the plane in Calgary in 95, having spent three years in the States. Yeah. And it wasn't a week that went by that I wasn't, what, going to a jam or something like that and going, what the fuck? Why does this feel so closed? Mm. Why? You know? And I have continued to, to, to be observant of that unfortunate fact, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, because I have experienced other geographies and other places that to me, at least the spirit of the place was wide open. I'm not judging anybody or anything. I'm saying that that felt good <laughs> mm -hmm. and that this necessarily hasn't felt the same. Mm -hmm. And so in respect to that, I really, it's always been my desire to get that feeling here. Mm. And uh, I, I don't think that's altruistic. I don't think it's utopian. I think it's possible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that's what I would love to create is just even the feeling, the vibe, the groove, you know, of people coming together around here. Mm -hmm. Entities that are worth, you know, lots of millions of dollars and the average citizen and everybody working together somehow 
because everybody's cool mm -hmm. and everybody's hip and everybody's got something to offer and nobody's hiding. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I would love to feel. Yeah. Um, and so, look, we've. Do you have anything? Go ahead. If you have something, well, I just think that you know, if one, um, if one wants one's environment to be flexible, then one also has to be flexible and adapt to the environment. Um, every time you go elsewhere geographically, uh, the culture there is going to be different. Um, and when I say culture, I'm not just referring to eth ethnicity or religious persuasion. I'm just referring to the general way in which people do things and the way in which the industry interacts with other industries. That's, that's the way it is. And when you go to different places in the world, you get to experience that. And that's actually a gift. I love that globalization hasn't taken so much hold that, um, that everywhere is the same. I mean, if you go somewhere else, it works differently. Um, you don't even have to go that far. The industry works pretty differently in Edmonton than it does in Calgary. It works quite differently in Winnipeg. It works quite differently in Vancouver. And of course it works differently in, you know, um, Detroit or wherever you go. Um, and so you got to meet halfway with your environment. And, uh, and I think that there are a lot of ways of doing that, but it requires one to take initiative and to reach out to people and say, hey, this is the kind of vibe I want to cultivate. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. And I guess, you know, I, I agree with you, but I, I know that from my human experience, uh, inclusivity always has felt better than exclusivity. Right. And so I guess that that's what I'm talking about. I don't know that that's geographical, although it does have to do, it does come down to culture. It does mm -hmm. have to do with what people think of each other in their geographical location. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I guess it's not that I want to change anybody's mind. It's just that I know when I experience inclusivity, mm -hmm. man, I feel like I can take on the world. Yeah. And when I feel exclusivity, even when it's, even when it's me benefiting from that exclusivity, I just, uh, it just doesn't feel like that comfortable jean jacket, you know? I agree. Uh, yeah. And so that feeling of my humanity, that sense of my humanity leads me to, to think mm -hmm. that perhaps one is necessarily more constructive than another. Be the change. So that's what I'm doing here today. I'm, I'm, I'm getting one kick-ass musician and, you know, uh, one generally happy motherfucker, uh, you know, to sit here and to talk to and, you know, to share our passion for what we do uh, and the passion for what you're doing outside of the passion that we share to bring this to people mm -hmm. and to at least make people aware so that they can make a choice, you mm -hmm. know, so that they can make an actual real choice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I know that something exists. I have no excuse. What do I do? Mm -hmm. Uh, when it comes down to that, I feel like I'm starting to do something. Right. I really, really appreciate you taking this time. Uh, and, you know, really speaking from your heart, man, really speaking from that, you know, from a depth and not just some surface bullshit. And thank you for having me. Thank you very much for having me. It's been great. You've been a great interviewer. You've asked lots of good questions. And uh, if anybody wants to, uh, to, to reach out and ask me a question, not that I consider myself to be a subject matter expert, but if anybody wants to ask a question about getting involved in an advocacy initiative for our industry or spearheading one even, um, I'm a pretty guy, easy guy to get a hold of. You just have to type my name into an internet search. The first thing that comes up is my profile on the association website, which has my email address and phone number, or you can just find me on Facebook or whatever, and I will always listen. I'll always offer whatever I can. Thanks again for having me, Gavin. You bet, man. Uh... Again, y'all be well, be well uh, in this moment. I, I, I mean that. And like I said, we'll do this again. There it is. <laughs> there it is. Thank you, brother.